Okay. So we are in Revelation chapter 16. And I failed to mention uh, Wednesday night that the chapter 16 part two notes were on the table. That was the first thing I was going to mention. And then I forgot. Uh, but I did, I did email them out as well, just in case you uh, didn't pick up an actual uh, paper version. But uh, so as I mentioned, so that the first part of the notes, we're going to have three parts of chapter 16. But the first part is the first six <laughs> bowls of wrath. Uh, as, as, as we went through last week, we discussed how that all these bowls of wrath uh, carry with it the sense of, of the judgment of God on the empire. And certainly as we talked about the... Uh, the different components that kind of ultimately brought down the empire from its height, okay, from its from its peak. What were the three components? What were the three main things that brought down the empire? Disease or, or, or uh, natural calamities, okay, earthquakes, things like that. What else? Yep, moral and and, and civil corruption. And then invasions and external forces that, that brought about their end. Uh, yeah, the, these are all the things, and historians all agree, that those are the three main components that brought down the Roman Empire from its peak to not being what it was ever again. And as we noted, these first, uh, second, and third bowls kind of focus on the, the physical the calamities that they were enduring, such as disease, as we talked about. Uh, I think it was the Antonian uh, Antonian plague that I mentioned, I think it was 170 AD that killed a third of the empire. Uh, and then certainly the, the issues regarding the, uh, the sea becoming as blood, but that's, that speaks to the kind of the maritime component of the Roman empire uh, and its economy, its military might. And of course, Rome, that's all it really had ultimately was its military and, and economic power. And then, of course, the, the rivers and the springs, the fresh water, which speaks to the, the, the necessities of life, uh, speaks to the, the fact that, that the very things that they, uh, as, as the, one of the, the angels, the angel of the waters, which speaks to these fresh water, uh, he mentions the fact that just as they killed the saints, now they're having to drink blood, uh, kind of their own bloods come, back, come, come upon them, so to speak. But we noticed here with the fourth and fifth angels, how that you have the sun that scorched men with fire, this angel that, that had the, the ability to scorch men with fire. And of course, that speaks to kind of this despair of life. And we saw that contrast earlier in Revelation where that uh, we're told that the saints that they, they, they will not be uh, suffer the heat of the sun and that sort of thing. So there's kind of a contrast there regarding kind of going through difficult of li difficulty of life. And we see with the fourth and fifth bowls how that they begin to blaspheme the name of God because of the things that they're going through. They're angry and they're upset. And instead of doing what the, it was meant to do, which was to be a call to change, a call to repent, we're told after the fourth and fifth bowls, they did not repent and give him glory, verse 9. And then in verse 11, we have the... Um, the pouring out of the bowl on the throne of the beast, which we didn't get to last week. But we see in verse 11 how that because of their pains and their sores, they did not repent of their deeds. And so the whole point of these things was to make them become aware of what they were doing. Become not only that they were persecuting the saints, but in serving the idols and serving the, the Caesars as gods, they were ultimately serving Satan and not God. And so all of this led to their, this physical judgment on Rome. And so as we see with verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. His kingdom became full of dark, darkness. Oh, I'm cut off a little bit. I'm sorry. Let me pull this off just a hair. There we go. Okay. Uh, verse uh, 10, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And I mentioned the, the idea of the darkness and the fact that darkness, when we go back in a couple chapters, go back a couple chapters back to uh, where the, the locusts come up out of the pit and, and there was this kind of this blindness, this darkness because of the smoke. And it, it seems to indicate not, not only the sense of 
a lack of understanding. It's more specifically spiritual understanding. And as a result of a lack of spiritual understanding, they're, they're, they're kind of blind to their state. Uh, and, and because obviously physically they had great understanding. I mean, there are systems they put in place that in principle we still use today, um, not only in government, but also in technology. And so they had great understanding in the flesh, but when it came to the soul, the spirit, there was this darkness. There was this uh, lack of awareness of the situation that they were in, but they cursed the, the fact that they were, that notice verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sorrows. They did not repent of their deeds. When we saw earlier, they sought death, but it, it, they couldn't, they couldn't receive it. They couldn't find it. And it was the idea that, that they, that they just kind of despised their life. And as the infrastructure of the Roman empire started to degrade, as invasions came, as uh, these diseases came and so forth upon the, the people of the empire, life was, it, it was a struggle to survive each day. And when you're in that struggle each day, it's, you just kind of despise your life. And this is basically the situation that, that is being described here as well. And so then in verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And, and verse 12, we talked about the, the river Euphrates and the four angels of the four corners of the Euphrates in past chapters. And, and that speaks to that. Uh, Euphrates is both a, it's obviously a literal, uh, literal river, but there's also a symbolic sense in that a lot of the major invasions of major world powers have taken place by armies crossing the Euphrates. So there is a symbolic element to this in that there's going to be invasions of Rome. But there's also a literal aspect to it because we know for a fact the Parthians crossed the Euphrates and invaded the Roman Empire as well as others. So it's, it, it's both a, there is a literal element to this, but it's also being used in a, in a symbolic or metaphorical way to recognize there's going to be outside forces that are, that are going to bring judgment or God's going to use them to bring judgment on the empire as well. Okay. Anything through verse 12 that we need to discuss before we get to our questions? Question one, what does the first bowl bring and what does it seem to represent? Yep. Yep. Okay, so, yeah, this first bowl, that loathsome sore that came upon almost, it's a kind of, it's being used singularly, the sense of, of a sore encompassing all of the people. Uh, and it's this sense of, of, dis, of, of, of physical despair, physical disease, uh, the physical pain that they were going through, kind of uh, focusing on that aspect of these, of these natural calamities. And certainly that would not only include disease, but also include some of the other situations that would bring about physical pain. On whom was it poured out specifically? Yeah, the empire, those who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped his image. And that's specifically who is being poured out on because were, were there saints in the Roman empire? Yeah, there were saints all throughout the empire. But it was, huh? My Paul was one. Yeah, he was a Roman citizen. But what's being described here is that this punishment is specifically meant for those who worship the beast or have the mark of the beast and worship his image. And we talked about the mark of the beast versus the mark of God uh, and how that the, the saints have the mark of God being the, the name of the father written on their forehead, chapter 14. But we talked to the contrast of that is basically the name of Satan. Who possesses these people? Well, the people of God are possessed by Jehovah. Therefore, they have his name on their forehead. And that's the sense in which it's shown in their behavior. It's shown in their conduct. And that's why sometimes in Revelation, you have either the mark on the forehead or the right hand. In the context of forehead or right hand. Because that's something that's easily seen. It's easily shown. It's not a literal mark or a literal tattoo or something like that. It's something that is easily observed. Remember, people greeted one another with the right hand, uh, and just as we do today. And the idea is this is something that you can, you can see in a person's life. Whether they serve Jehovah, that would be very obvious. 
or whether they serve the beast. That also is going to be very obvious. Uh, that's going to be seen in how they work and how they, the, the, whether they, they um, take the oath of, of loyalty and, and worship of Caesar, uh, whether they pour out their libations in their, their guilds and their workplaces to the gods, uh, Greek gods, Roman gods. And so we're talking about individuals who are possessed, who are owned, ultimately, even though they think they're serving these false gods, they think they're serving the, the Caesars, ultimately they're owned by the great dragon. Because remember, we talked about how both the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth both serve the great dragon. The beast of the, of the sea was the Roman Empire, but the beast of the earth was this system of idolatry, system of Caesar worship that was embedded within the empire and actually enforced it for several hundred years. And so this idea of being having the mark of the beast, those who worshiped his image, they are possessed by Satan. Yeah. Uh, question two, what does the second bowl bring and what does it seem to represent? The seed turns to blood. Okay. And why is that particularly applicable to the Roman Empire? Yeah, it, it's the whole, that was the whole base of their economic and military power. <coughs> that, that was the whole, I mean, you cut, if you cut Rome off from the sea, it has no means of economy. It has no means of military. Okay, it was the, the, the mean, it was basically the, 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 the method by which their fingers stretched over the whole world. Uh, because remember, Italy has this kind of a natural barrier, natural uh, for, uh, fortification to the north. You know what that is? The Alps. Okay, the Alps, uh, the, the, these, these mount, this mountain range that makes it very, very difficult, although we know that there were some who did and did invade Rome, even though they, they had that, fort that kind of natural fortification. They still crossed the, uh, crossed the mountains and invaded uh, Rome anyway. But uh, they kind of had this natural barrier. And so the ocean was kind of there. That was the means by which they reached out over the world. You start taking that away, and all of a sudden they aren't able to do the things that, they're, that they want to do. Uh, question three, what does the third bowl bring and what does it seem to represent? Yeah, the springs and fresh waters, uh, the rivers turn to blood as well. What does that represent? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the necessities of life. Okay, I mean, we can go, I mean, Jesus went 40 days without food in the wilderness. In fact, we can go for a length of time without food. But we cannot survive more than two or three days without water. Uh, we have to have water. And uh, the idea of taking away that, that source of life, and, and that's the source of necessities of life, the, that infrastructure that provided a lot of those necessities, it, it, it starts being taken away, being stripped away. Yeah. Uh, and then why is there a separation of sea and rivers of the springs of water? What's the difference between the two? One is salt water, one is fresh. And that kind of helps us to understand kind of what's being focused on with the symbolism, why they're separated between two things. Why there's the, the sea as a separate bowl of wrath from the springs of water and rivers and so forth. Question four, how are the words of the angel of the waters in verses five and six especially important to understand given the current attitude and views of the religious community? Now, the angel of the waters, that would be the angel of these springs and rivers. Verse 5, he says, You're righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is to be, because you have judged these things. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And you could even include the words of, of this other angel from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Why, why is that particularly applicable and particularly important to emphasize to people of our current day religious community? How, how would they view some of these actions of God? Mean, cruel, harsh. Okay, the God they believe in, the God they claim to know and claim to love is not Jehovah. They call him Jehovah. They call their Messiah Jesus. But what they teach is a different Jesus. What they teach is a different Jehovah. They don't teach the Jehovah of the Bible. 
Because this, these angels recognize that, that God, his judgments are true and just. Let God be true and every man a liar. Okay, the idea that, that it is your way that is not fair, not my way, God, God, God tells his people. And so the importance that, that we need to place on helping people to see both the goodness and severity of God. So often in the religious community, people don't want to hear about the severity part. They don't want to hear about the judgment part. They don't want to hear about, about God's justice. All they want to hear about is God's love. Well, God is both, his, you have his goodness and his severity. You have his love, but also his justice. And both of those are important to emphasize. And by eliminating an entire half side of that, you're really teaching a false God. You're teaching a false Jehovah and a false Messiah. I mean, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only what? Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. There are going to be religious people at judgment who are going to say, Lord, Lord, we did these things in your name. And yet Jesus is going to tell them you were lawless. You didn't have law for what you did. You didn't do what I told you to do. You did what you wanted to do. And then you just attached my name to it. All right, anything through uh, question four? Yes, sir. Well, just the, in the verse six there, the shedding of the blood of the saints and prophets, they, they rejected the message from God as being sent from God that could have spared them. Yeah. And so that's part of this as well. Absolutely. It does certainly include God's character, but God is sending messengers to give them what they need to do to repent be straight, but they're putting them crucified. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're killing the, killing the messenger in the hopes of killing the message, which is something obviously that man has tried for a long time. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the killing of the saints and the prophets, it, it's, it's trying to, to out of sight, out of mind type of thing. All right. Question five. What does the fourth bowl bring and what does it seem to represent? Yeah, sorrow, difficulty of life. It's the scorching heat of the sun upon man. And remember the very first verse of chapter 16. These are the, the, the bowls of wrath that were poured out on the what? On the earth. Okay, and that's very important to remember. That's what kind of reminds us verse 8. It, this is not being literal. This is symbolic. It's the idea of this, this pain and the suffering and the sorrow of life that men are having to deal with because and it, and it wasn't overnight and it was gradual which may have actually made it worse the fact that it was gradual instead of it all happening at once and then we can move on no it was gradual it was over a couple hundred years that this took place and and one by one these these amenities and these necessities uh, the the diseases would come in invasions would come in earthquakes and so forth and, and it just provided this sense of, of, of just despair and sorrow of life. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one commentary mentioned the fact that you've got uh, the water that turned to blood and then you have heat bearing down. And so you don't have any means of being able to, to not only do you have not any means of, of quenching that heat and that thirst that would come from heat, but also imagine the, the if it would imagine a physical scene like that and how much it would stink the river's blood the springs are blood the sea is blood you know all the animals in the sea would have died all the animals in the rivers would have died uh, and then you have no means of being able to to support yourself yeah uh question number six what does the fifth bowl bring and what does it seem to represent Fifth bowl brings what? Darkness. Darkness. And notice this was poured on the throne of the beast. Okay, the center of its power. And I think that that, there's commentaries are, are kind of differ in terms of, are we talking about specifically Rome itself, the city of Rome, and because the city of Rome ended up being kind of separated from its empire, that that kind of started the, this darkness I, I tend to think of this more so as the idea of the throne of the beast. The whole idea of its power rests upon, yes, those physical components of military and economic power and so forth. But remember, the idea of darkness here speaks as well to the spiritual lack of awareness. 
the spiritual darkness and blindness of their state. And so the idea of the throne of the beast, I think, may speak to this, this sense of, of that which is within the empire, the spirit of the empire. Uh, was blinded the sense of the people within they put all of their hope and their faith in the physical empire their their gods their false gods and their the worship of their caesars and they had nothing that gave them any kind of sense of life or any substance uh, and so as a result of that again they blasphemed god verse 11 because of their pains and their sores and they refused to repent all right question seven what does the six bowl bring and what does it seem to represent Yeah, yeah, the Euphrates and the armies that would invade across, not just literally the Euphrates, but the sense of armies invading uh, the empire. The idea of it drying up, it's just a sense that God is going to be sending these invasions, these armies, just as God did with Babylon or with Assyrian Babylon uh, and, and other, uh, in Israel itself, Israel and Judah, both of them. So, I mean, God's going to do the same thing here with the empire with, with a very specific reason as well. All right, question eight. What is said by men after the fourth and fifth bowls that is especially sad? They blaspheme God and they refuse to repent. Yeah, that's especially sad. And in particular, why did they react this way? Huh? It's hard for us to figure it out. Well, and I think that speaks a little bit to that darkness. Okay, that blindness, that they're blaspheming the name of God. And, and, and I, I want to suggest here that maybe they're not so much literally in the sense of blaspheming Jehovah, but they're, they're praying all the more to their false gods. They're offering their worship and their, their sacrifices all the more because of these terrible things that are happening. And so they're calling out to Zeus and they're calling out to these false gods all the more saying, why are you letting this happen to us? And instead of turning to the one true God, which was being taught in the empire, but people refused to listen, they're turning to their false gods. And so I suggest that that's how they're blaspheming God. Not so much that they're literally blaspheming the name of Jehovah, but that by turning to these false gods even more, putting all the more trust and faith and prayer and sacrifice and, and so forth, maybe even into the Caesars, and yet it's leading them down the road. But that's the very thing that led them down to the road, down the road of destruction to start with. But they don't see that because their hearts and minds are blind. All right. Anything through question eight? Paul would describe that as a hard and impenitent heart. Hard and impenitent. Yes. Hard because of your hard and impenitent hearts. You've st stored up for yourselves judgment and wrath. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hard and impenitent hearts is a good way to describe them. Yeah. Stubborn, stiff necked. All right. All right, so let's move on to uh, the chapter or the chapter 16, part two notes. And I wanted to kind of give this its own set of notes because verses 13 on through 16 are, we want to, this is, this is one of these uh, crux points, I guess you could say, one of these linchpins of revelation that people in our community, people in our world do not understand. They don't get it. And they, they combine different elements. Remember one of those linchpins we talked about was with the trumpets and the, the, uh, the, the horsemen of death and all that that we talked about. Well, starting here, verse 13, we have a unique term used in this uh, series of, of verses that people take out of context and don't understand the proper meaning of it. So we want to give uh, due attention to this. So starting in verse 13, he says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So these first, or 13 and 14, we were introduced to what some commentaries refer to as the generals of this war, this battle. But they're described as unclean spirits like frogs. Okay, now the unclean spirits like frogs is something that none of the commentaries really wanted to touch on why they're frogs. Uh, it's just kind of whether they appeared like frogs or they moved like frogs. For whatever reason, it was frogs. Now, 
it is notable that in Leviticus chapter 11, what were the people, uh, what were the, the people told, the children of Israel told regarding clean and unclean animals that they could and couldn't partake of? Frogs was one of the unclean animals. And I wonder if that's why the association of unclean spirits, okay, which is to say this, this defiled character, this defiled desire. And of course, Satan's behind the whole thing. And that's what we talk about with the dragon. You know, these kind of unholy trinity, so to speak. You've got the, the Satan, and then you've got the beast of the earth, and then the false prophet, which the Roman Empire and the system of idolatry. And so all three are kind of going to put forth their effort of, of persecuting the saint, which is their effort of destroying that which is good. Okay, remember we, we read back, it was a chapter 12, that because the great dragon couldn't reach the woman, he can't affect the plan of God. He can't destroy that. So who's he going to focus his attention on? Her offspring, which is us. Okay, the offspring of the plan of God is the church. It's the people of the body of Christ. And so he's going to focus his attention on trying to hurt it as much as he can. And so this battle, this, this war against good and evil, Satan's going to put forth all the effort that he can to, to focus on this. And so this may be why they're referred to as frogs. They're unclean. Uh, like frogs, again, not necessarily that they looked like that or necessarily that they moved that way, although those are both possibilities, but they were unclean like frogs coming out of the mouth. And notice they're coming out of the mouth. Okay, what, what was the significance of, of the mouth? Words. Yeah, words. That which comes out of the mouth specifically speaks to what I say and how I say things. And so if what I say is defiled and unclean, then what, what, could I, what could the dragon and the beast and the false prophet be saying that is defiled and unclean? What are they teaching? What are they, what are they promoting? False gods. The, the worship of, of Caesar as deity. Okay, and then the allowance of their Caesars to, to proclaim themselves deity. And so the idea of these unclean spirits, it's, it's as if they're going in through the people. And again, it's, this is metaphorical. It's not literal. It's not like these spirits forced people to worship the false gods. But the empire did. The empire forced people to worship false gods. But the idea is that, that, that teaching and that, that uh, encouragement to worship and, and to give all of your, your attention and devotion to these false gods and the Caesars as gods. They're toxic frogs in that Mediterranean area that their skin secretes toxins and so anything that tries to eat them they usually they don't succeed but I, I think I did remember I, I read I read that you know somewhere just uh, yeah I didn't know about there those be two or three species of them. interesting yeah. yeah so well that may be another component of this as well the idea of the toxicity that those frogs are nasty yeah, yeah yeah no licking frogs there huh? uh all right, so, so yeah, so that, and that toxicity, that, that kind of, you know, you think this is good, but then it turns out bad. That may be kind of the opposite of, of kissing a frog, turning into a prince type of thing as well. It's kind of the opposite of that. Um, so, but then in verse 14, they are spirits of demons performing signs. Now, remember, we had this defined for us. Was it back in chapter 13? Uh, yes, chapter 13 and in verse 14. Do you remember... Were they performing miracles? Like, are they performing works of God? How, how does how does how is it described in chapter thirteen and verse fourteen? Deceptive tricks, okay, deception, trickery, craftiness. These aren't real. This isn't the real power of God. Only God can do miracles. And the fact some translations have performing miracles, but the term literally is signs. Okay, which those signs are not to prove that God exists or that God is all powerful or Jehovah is all powerful. Those, these signs are intended to do what? Deceive. To make people think that the gods of Rome and, and, and Greece are the true gods or that Caesar is God. So they trick people into believing these things. They go out to the kings of the earth. And of course, remember at the time, Roman Empire, it is... The, the empire of the world and even areas that they allow to kind of rule themselves they pay homage to Rome 
and they certainly, uh, in some cases, both economically, military, uh, and in other ways, they yield to the empire, if only to out of the uh, desire to continue to exist, they're willing to kind of become vassals, I guess you could say, of Rome. And so they kind of gather them, the whole world together, everybody together against God, but ultimately against that which is good and pure and against the saints as well. All right, anything through verse 14. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That's interesting. Yeah, like frogs will come out and they're very accurate and they, you know, pluck the insects when they're flying and that sort of thing. That's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought about that. That maybe the, the kind of like frogs' tongues, these coming out of the mouth, it's very accurate, very pinpoint, very specific for a purpose. And that purpose is to deceive people into the this idolatry and, and Caesar worship. That's a, that's a good point. I'll have to add that to my notes as well. All right, verse 15. So, Jesus says, and we know it's Jesus speaking, not because John wrote it in red ink, but why? I am coming quickly. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. It's at this point Jesus interjects. Okay, John is seeing these this vision he's seeing these things and jesus throws in here in, in verse 16 we see it pick right back up with these these generals or these frogs these unclean spirits and how they're gathering so it's as if jesus interrupts this to say behold i'm coming as a thief blessed is he who so it's almost as if jesus is he is he directing this to the roman empire or to the the world who's he directing this to the saints. He's speaking to the saints. Now, there are those who've argued that, behold, I'm coming as a thief, and, and the, the, they try to link this battle of Armageddon, that's what we're going to be talking about, to uh, uh, the sense of the judgment day. And yet, and they say that, that Jesus only ever uses this analogy of coming as a thief in the context of judgment day. But that's not true. Jesus also uses the analogy of coming as a thief in the night with the judgment on Jerusalem back in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, there's also the sense of this coming as a thief of the church of Sardis uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 3 and in verse 3. Behold, I, I will come as a thief upon you. Uh, and there's a sense of judgment upon Sardis that they refuse to repent. So this is not just, Jesus didn't just use the analogy of a thief to represent judgment day, but anything that could come quickly with, if you weren't paying attention, it would come upon you and calamity would result. This is why in Matthew 24, when Jesus warns about the destruction of Jerusalem, he tells his disciples, be ready, look for the signs that I'm telling you about, which he, he described in great detail in Matthew 24. When you see these signs, you leave, you get out. That's why he says as a thief, well, unless you're watching and you're, you're, main, you're being vigilant and you're guarding, it's going to come upon you and you're not going to expect it. And you're not going to be ready and you're going to get caught unawares. Well, the same is true for Judgment Day. But also in this situation, speaking directly to the saints, behold, I'm coming as a thief. Which is to say what? Is Jesus going to steal something? What's the point of that? You're, you will not expect it at a time where, where there's not going to be any specific sign to say, oh, there's Jesus or Jesus is coming in 10 minutes. There's not going to be anything like that. And I suggest to you, verse 15, this isn't judgment day that he's referring to, but judgment on Rome, just as he used it in Matthew 24 with judgment on Jerusalem. Blessed is he who watches. Okay, the idea of watching means to remain vigilant, to remain awake. Uh, keeps his garments. That term keep means to guard, to, to protect. And of course, again, we have kind of the contrast with Sardis because what, we, what do we learn about some of the brethren in Sardis? Some of them had not defiled their garments. They, they will walk with me in white. Okay, so throughout Revelation and really throughout the New Testament, the idea of white garments is pure and holy, doing what God wants. 
Whereas stained garments suggests what? Sin. Yeah, sin. And so Jesus is encouraging you to remain awake, remain aware and vigilant. You maintain the purity of your garment, which is your character, your, your conduct, okay, your life as a walking the way you ought to, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Do you remember what Jesus warned about the Laodiceans in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3? They, they, they claim, oh, look, we, look at all the stuff we have, and we're, we're self-sufficient, and, and we're, we have all the clothes we want, and we have all the food we want, all this stuff. And what did Jesus say? I counsel you to do what? Buy from me garments. That the naked shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And, and so there's, it's a really interesting component because he's not speaking physically, he's speaking spiritually. And the idea of those who are defiled, those who are uh, full of sin or not walking as they should, they're described as naked because they're not clothed in righteousness. If they're not clothed in righteousness, then they have nothing. Okay, it's the idea and that shame, just as shame is connected to nakedness physically throughout the Bible, going all the way back to Genesis, uh, so also is the spiritual nakedness associated with shame. And the idea is you keep your garments. Do not allow that garment of righteousness, of purity and holiness to, to become stained. And now you, you don't, you're, you're naked. And there is nothing that, that uh, you, you're, it's, it's a, as, from a spiritual perspective, there's a shame associated with it. And so this is an encouragement. It is a, a call uh, and a reminder to these saints, don't become lackadaisical. Don't become, and certainly, I mean, even though, again, verse 15, I think, is, is in context to this judgment on Rome, but what other principle does it apply to? Saints for all time. Saints for all time. Okay, saints for all time. Because ultimately, do these same uh, calls from Jesus apply to judgment day? Absolutely. Absolutely, they do. Anything through verse 15? Verse 15, the they? Yeah. Let's see. I didn't look at that. And Okay, so there is no they. It's just his, his shame would be seen. Okay. Yeah, the term, yeah, the term is just see. There's no they, uh, no pronoun they there. So, and his shame is seen, basically. So I, I would suggest his shame would be certainly by God, uh, but maybe even more so fellow saints or, or whatnot. Uh, Walking, walking naked suggests a, a pattern of behavior, pattern of life. We talk about walking. All right. Verse 16. They gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Uh, now they here in verse 16, that's speaking back to verse 14, which is these unclean spirits. Okay. They're gathering to this battle against the Lord. And it's interesting because John is the only one who explains multiple occasions in multiples of his writings what a word in Hebrew is. None of the other writers in the New Testament did this at any point. It's John, and I, and I think the best explanation for this is because John is writing so much later than everybody else. Okay, John's writing the late 90s. As far as we know, he's the last apostle alive. And so for some of this, he may be specifically, because this comes up multiple times, for instance, John chapter 5, John 19, twice in John 19, and then here in Revelation, and then again in Revelation 9, and then here in Revelation 16. So it's really interesting that, that John, there's these multiple occasions where he says, that's called in the Hebrew, this, uh, as if he has to explain that for some reason. Uh, but he does. And this Armageddon or Harmageddon, as some of your translations, I think American Standard has Harmageddon. It literally means the hill or mount of Megiddo. Okay, that's, that's what the term means. The hill or the mount. Har meaning, meaning mount. Megiddo or Megiddo. And it, it's interesting when you start going back through the Bible. Megiddo is not mentioned in the New Testament, not even once. But it's mentioned multiple times in the Old Testament. 12 times total. Uh, but 
when it refers to Megiddo, it refers to the towns of Megiddo, which suggests that Megiddo, Megiddo was kind of like a, a, a region, not just a specific place. But the towns of Megiddo, the waters of Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo, which would also be the valley of Jezreel. They were known by two different names. Uh, but that's how it's referred to. Interestingly enough, there is no hill of Megiddo. Not only is it not mentioned in the Bible, the hill of Megiddo, but it's also not found geographically either. So when we talk about Megiddo, that's not what Megiddo is. What happened? Okay. All right. Well, we talk about Megiddo. This is, this is Megiddo here. And notice how far we are from Jerusalem. So remember uh, the, the Mount Zion that's referred to back in chapter 14. And we talked about some of the issues literalists have and looking at this as literally Jerusalem. Well, now all of a sudden we're in Megiddo. And so the idea of it being literal just doesn't seem to make sense. But uh, you don't see it on this map, but uh, Mount Carmel is up here near the coast at this point right here. Megiddo's here. Here's Nazareth there. And then on this map, it zone, kind of zooms in just a little bit. But you, like I said, Mount Carmel, here's Je the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley goes all the way down through here for 85 miles. It goes through. And Megiddo is at the mouth. So it's, it's, it's a plain at the mouth of the Jezreel Valley or the, the Megiddo Valley. Uh, but this is Megiddo. This is Jezreel. And obviously Mount Carmel and Jezreel come up a whole lot in the Old Testament, especially with uh, regard to Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel, uh, the Valley of Jezreel. I mean, talk about you got Barak and Deborah versus the kings of Canaan. You got Gideon uh, against the Midianites, Saul versus the Philistines, uh, Egypt versus Josiah. And then you've got Ahaziah versus Jehu. And then in the 1400s BC, there was this massive battle, massive war uh, Egypt versus Canaan here in the Valley of Jezreel as well. So it's, it's a site because of its geographic importance, uh, geopolitical importance, I guess, it, it kind of becomes a confluence of all these conflicts, not just in the Bible, but also in secular history. So it's interesting then that this specific place is used to refer to this battle in Revelation. But if it's a literal battle being described, then there's, in addition to a whole lot of other issues, there's some literal aspects to this that would pose a problem. The enemy generals should be frogs. The, uh, it would be impossible for 200 million horsemen to march in formation one mile wide, 85 miles long. That's from chapter nine and verse 16. Remember these horsemen and how it was like 200 million horsemen that John saw and how they, this is a one mile wide, 85 mile long valley, and that won't fit. And then as we talked about from last chapter or chapter 14, a 200 mile long river of blood would not fit in this valley. Remember the wine press and from that wine press came blood and it came up to being about five or six inches tall, 200 miles long. That valley won't fit that either. So it doesn't make sense that this would be a literal battle at the hill of Megiddo, which doesn't exist. There's no hill of Megiddo. All right, we'll stop here. We'll pick up again with this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Armageddon. Uh, I'll have the, um, the notes for part three for the rest of chapter 16 on Wednesday night, and I'll make sure to announce that those are on the table Wednesday night as well. Thank you, everybody.